You, Lord, have provided all that we need. We just return to you a little bit. We thank you for your great faithfulness, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll see you guys in a little bit, about two hours when we're done with the message. And then um, no one even batted an eye. It's like, yeah, yeah, right. Heard that one before. Um, so I'm going to show you a series of pictures. I'm just going to ask you a quick question. In, on these, in these scenarios, what is being prepared for if they come up, OCL? So if you would take us to our first slide. Pool table. What is, what is being good? You're good, man. You're good. So, it, that's not a pool table, so that's kind no, of weird. the next photo. Oh, the next photo. <laughs> that looks like something else. So. Is it, is it going to work, or do I have to make some adjustments? Right. Alright, that's it. So we'll just go with it. What what's being prepared for here? Playing a game of pool. Game game Playing a game of pool, right? This is a billiards table. Go on to the next. What about here? What's being prepared for? Table tennis? Ping pong? It's funny, that's onomatopoeia, isn't it? The name it makes. Ping pong ping pong. But it's table tennis. Uh, the third thing. Anyone you know what that is? Poker. I mean, it might be poker, but it's a card table, right? That table's being prepared to gamble. Sin. It's a sin, right? Yeah, no, I knew you were going to say it. I jumped ahead of you. <laughs> but this is a card table. Uh, and then finally, what's this? Can you see that? Dinner. 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 Looks like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, right? This is a Thanksgiving table that's being prepared uh, or, or has been prepared for a meal, for some connection. Last year I preached a sermon about preparing the table based on a vision that I had received from the Lord regarding COVID. And it was, I think it was March 20th is when I delivered that message. I got this image of a table and I put the table right up here on the platform, right here behind me, and it had a bunch of things on it. In the vision, the Lord gently but seriously took his arm and wiped the table clean. The things that were on the table represented areas in our life that we are familiar with, that we uh, participate in, that we value. And it was as though COVID came and God said, nope, all that stuff has to go. The things that we're familiar with, like shopping and gathering and hobbies, activities, uh, all these things have, that have been disrupted or lost in the past year. Also during that sermon, I read Ezekiel 22. I want to encourage you, if you haven't read Ezekiel 22 in a while, read Ezekiel 22 again. And it, and it, might, it might cause a little uh, angst in your spirit because the message is very strong. It's a terrifyingly strong warning about what we and what the people in Israel needed to do. And God, at the end of that, asks Ezekiel, or tells Ezekiel that he was looking for someone standing in the gap on behalf of the land, and he couldn't find anyone. So for the last year, in some ways, God has been asking us to stand in the gap on behalf of the land. And I wonder if we actually did that or not. I, I was talking to Asher. He left so I can talk about him. Uh, but we, we did a little job for someone and we drove like 40 minutes away. And as we're going out there, I, I was just urging him to learn from the experiences that he was having. If he doesn't learn the lesson now, there will likely be a retest. And, and I'm like, at some point, you, you probably want to pass the test, you know. And that doesn't mean that it's over because then there's a the next chapter. You know, there's the, the next unit that you have to go and, and take the test and pass as well. But, you know, I think what God is telling us, look, this, this wiping off of the table was an opportunity for us to experience a test. And how we respond to it will let us know if we move on to the next level, if we level up, or if we have to retake it. And so it, it's a little concerning to me. And uh, I covered four areas that we needed to consider in resetting the table. You know, here we know what's on the table, we know what it represents, what's being prepared. But we've got a life as well that, in essence, there are things that are set on that table. And what's there? So I urge us to look at our interactions politically, uh, socially, like in vocation and how we interact with people out in, in public, our families and our faith. 
The question is, has anything really changed for you as we've come out of that in those, in those areas? Have you taken any time to consider how you're doing in each of these areas of your life? Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally, vocationally, have you considered what has changed? Have you considered how you're doing in those areas? And, and it's not just considering how I'm doing compared to someone else, but it's compared to God's standard. Because ultimately, he wants us to become more like him. And so we take our lives as this table, and he says, you got all this stuff, let me just sweep it off. Let me help you reset the table in a way that will help you become more like me. Have you been more influenced by the scripture or the culture in these last 15 months? You think about all that we've experienced. It's been traumatizing in many ways. From, from racial things to political things to, to viruses to world type events. We're setting the table for something. The question is what? There are things that we're doing that either are moving us closer to God the one who loves us deeply and created us to be with him for good works that he's prepared in advance, or we're moving further apart from him. And if COVID should have shown us anything, it's that those areas that we've created, that in, in certain areas we've created these little gods, these mini idols that direct us in ways that move us away from God. It, it might be how we're spending our time what we're watching on TV, our, how we value work, some of the relationships that we have, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, they, they, they're little mini idols. We create a God in our own image that we're comfortable with, that is okay with what we're doing, and it moves us away from Him. If we're, if we're just going to be a hundred, if we're just going to be serious and honest, we would acknowledge that some of the things on our table are not preparing us to be who God wants us to be. They are no good for us. They're no good for anyone. They actually prohibit, block, impede, stifle, wreck, slow, or negatively influence our ability to connect with Jesus personally. We have things in our life that are keeping us from becoming who God intended. Every one of us. It may not be an action. It might be an attitude or a thought. Uh, some inclination, some comfort. Effectively, we are sabotaging what God intends by the choices that we make. We think that we can, we can manage and, and make our lives better than God can. And then we wonder, where are you, God? And God's like, you're blaming me. I don't know why you're blaming me. Uh, I told you. I didn't only really tell you. I showed you. I sent signs and wonders. I sent circumstances in the world. I sent opportunities. I've given you escape hatches. I've sent forgiveness. I've given you tests, examples, warnings. I've sent my Holy Spirit to actually help you. You alone have chosen your way. Don't be up in here blaming me. <laughs> you know what you should be doing, or you know someone that can help you figure out what you should be doing. It really comes down to, do you want it? Now, I know how to lose weight. It's not a mystery. Eat better, exercise more. It's that simple. I don't need another trainer. I don't need a book. I don't need to sign up to something. I probably do because <laughs> struggling, but but you know the point is, that, don't be laughing. It's, it's not that fun. It's not bad. <laughs> She's like, you right, man. You got problems. <laughs> no, you know, it, it isn't that complicated. I just need to eat better and exercise a little bit more. I'm giving you permission to hold me accountable to that. My wife first. She you knows she's always been trying to, but I'm like, no, I don't need your help. I don't know what I need to do. <laughs> but how about you? Do you know what you should be doing? 
and yet aren't doing it? The question is, why not? God has cleared off the table so we can reset it well. And we have a choice in this. Are you just like emotionally tired or stressed or, or down and feel like giving up more than you have in the past? Or are you wandering through each day wondering what on earth God has put you here for? Or what has God put you on earth for? Are you more fearful about death and sickness than you were in the past? Have, have you, have you moved, moved away from a place of hope to a place of hopelessness? Do you feel alone and not completely understood or known? Are you just set in the way that you do things and you got it down, you're comfortable? If you are, these are signs that you put the wrong things on the table. Are you doing what God has uniquely gifted you to do? Are you as generous as you can be? Do you see the needs of people and do whatever you can to meet them? Are you boldly proclaiming that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to others? Are you hearing from God on a regular basis and then putting into practice what he tells you? If not, these are indicators that you put the wrong thing on the table. You and I, in some ways, have allowed the devil, the enemy, the world, the flesh, to interfere with God's specific plan that he intends to carry out through you. God wants more than what we're settling for in our lives. He's got a plan for us. So I'm going to suggest that wherever you are, you can always be closer to the Lord. That whoever you are, you have things on the table that need to not be there. And it's easy to point and say, well, it's better than that person. Well, I don't have a weight problem. Well, that may not be your problem, but I ain't got your problem either. So mine might be this, but yours is this. Again, these are actions, thoughts, or attitudes. The reality is that God desires to be with us, and we get to set the table to prep for something with you. That's the whole plan. This is all like the introduction. I'm just letting you know. We're going to read through the entire chapter of Acts 4. And look at what actually God did through his people in real life that he intends to do with us as well. If we took the Bible seriously, and look, don't get defensive. You're like, I do take it seriously. Okay, yeah, you do. But let's, if we were to examine our lives closely by the Bible, we would all have to say, I don't know, ooh, I'm not doing that. Ah, that's, ooh. Yeah, so you may take it seriously, but, but by take it seriously, I mean... If we really did what it said, we would see the church explode. Not just this church, but the church that Jesus Christ established. We would see faith in the midst of persecution. We'd see rejoicing and suffering, not complaining. We'd see homes thriving, relationships flourishing, kids vibrant and optimistic about the future. Parents and their children connected. Communities uh, revived or brought to life for the first time even. You know, there are areas that are just straight up dead. We're never alive. They need birth. Uh, communities need to be born. And, and partially that's what we're doing with Marcus. Is we're going into places where the church is not gone and trying to create a community through God's power, through the Holy Spirit. We would see people's needs being met, addictions overcome, the lonely set in families, the hurting healed, the lost found, the sad filled with, with hope. It would be amazing. You know, I did a funeral for Mitchell. Mitchell's aunt passed away. And, it, and I told you guys this last week, I believe that I'm sitting in here. These are a bunch of bikers. And they were just wonderful people. And I just thought, they need to be with us. We need them. And, and I'll go to other places. I'm like, I was at, uh, uh, what is it, Westview uh, Estates, this apartment up north of here. And I'm helping someone move in and bumping into all these people. I'm like, they need to be with us. We need them. We would see that if we took the Bible seriously. We would see community established. We would see transformation. The book of Acts gives us a great outline for how to live by faith. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are first-hand accounts of what Jesus did while he was walking on earth. You can you pull up this next slide, OCL? 
if, if it's possible. And you go one more. Um, so in the book of Acts, we get, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we get uh, a focus on what Jesus did in, when he was walking on the earth. And Acts is a sequel to Luke's book, you know, the third gospel. Acts is a sequel which is focused on what Jesus began to do. Acts goes on to tell us what Jesus does through the church. And we're an extension of that. So we're called the Extension Church for a lot of reasons. To extend God's love. We're an extension of Plymouth Covenant. We're an extension of the book of Acts. Because Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, moved through people in that time, we exist. What happened here in the book of Acts can be directly, we can trace our history directly to it. What happened that day in, in, or in, during that, that period of time. This really describes how Jesus moved in and through his people by the Holy Spirit as his people focused on the Holy Spirit. That's what this is all about. As we focus on the Holy Spirit, we will see some of these things take place. When Jesus was in a place of prominence, the world was impacted significantly. And when Jesus takes a place of prominence in our lives, the world that he's put us in, the spheres of influence, our schools, our homes, our neighborhoods, will be impacted significantly. So we're going to read all of that. And while I... I, I uh, while we do read through it, I want you to take note of the things that the believers did, their attitudes, the results of their behavior, the good and the bad, and what it will mean for us. Then I'm going to share what we should do as individuals and members of one body. So let's read uh, Acts 4. I, it is going to be up here if you don't have your Bible, but I encourage you, take notes in your, you know, the Bible is a holy book, but you can take notes in it. Um, things that stick out. From what God did in and through those believers, what they experienced, their attitudes and results. So the, the priest and the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So what do we see there? What, what did they experience? What did they do? And what did they experience? I thought they stopped the, the preaching, but instead it grew. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the opposition tried to stop them from preaching and stop them from growing, but it actually didn't, it didn't happen. So what did the believers do? What was the church doing then? That had to be stopped. You said it too. Teaching doctrine. They were teaching. Yep. There, there was some evangelism, right? They were preaching about Jesus. It says that right there, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. End of verse two. Uh, the, yep. Yeah, they they were at this point. There was no laying hands on of people, but except they got laid their hands on by the, the those who were prosecuting them or persecuting. In order to teach and preach, you have to first what? Believe. Believe, yep. In here it says it right at the end of verse 1. They were speaking. Right, they were speaking to people. Yeah. It starts with speaking to people. We, we've got to start speaking to people. And then we might have an opportunity to teach people. And ultimately we want to preach about Jesus to people. That happened. And as a result of that, what happened to them? There, were, there was some persecution. They got what? Put in jail. They got put in jail. They got seized, stopped, and put in jail. But as a result of that, many believed. Speak, teach, preach. Trouble growth. I mean, this is part of what's going to happen. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, 
John Alexander and uh, John Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? So what happened to him here? This will happen to us as well. I kind of cheat, but uh, the, I'm, the underlining is what stuck out for me. So I, if that if it connects with you, I want you to share that as well. But they, they, they've aroused curiosity, and now they've got authorities asking questions. Yeah. So there was a, there was a level of because they were speaking, they were teaching, proclaiming. People were curious, and and even the the authorities began to question them. You might be questioned in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family. That's a part of it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. And all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So what did they experience here? Filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is kind of the, the most important component of all of it, is it's this filling of the Holy Spirit. If you read the book of Acts, I don't think there's a chapter, there might be, uh, I think like 15 or something, that doesn't talk about them being filled with the Spirit, how the Spirit was moving in their midst. It's the Spirit's presence is is as uh, vivid and, and apparent as Jesus was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how important the Spirit was here. So, if you wanted to know what God wanted when Jesus was on Earth, you had to be near Jesus. But when He ascended into heaven, now you just need to be filled with the Spirit. And, and the work can be done everywhere. They were filled with the Spirit. That what, what was Jesus doing through the church? He was filling them with the Spirit. What else? What else do we see from this? Well, that filling gives them this ability to speak boldly. But that filling also gave them the ability to heal. Yeah, there was some healing, right? There was healing here. And we're going to get to the, the boldness because it's not quite in here yet where we see this, but it is, it is implicit. If you're standing before rulers and, and proclaiming, and there's something implicit in that, like, you don't even have to say it, man. That takes courage to actually be speaking to people, to pro proclaim the resurrection. It takes some courage. But, you know, they were doing, and I, it hit me as I was preparing for this, if we're being called to count today for an act of kindness, they didn't even see that as some, like, Spiritual thing. I don't, it doesn't, that, an act of kindness? Now they were moved by the Holy Spirit and it was a healing and they know that that only came through God. But I, I just love the language there. This is an act of kindness. That's what's happening. Anything else from this? Similar to when uh, uh, Stephen was being stoned because it gave him a chance to recount the history of why yeah. they were there. Yeah, there was a there was a level of going back and explaining what got us to this point. Uh, so we need to know, and that's why I started out with saying that the book of Acts is a sequel to Luke, which was Jesus' time on earth. Acts is Jesus moving through the church, and we're here today. It, this, is, this is part of a bigger picture. And we can even go back further from the beginning, we're created in God's image, you know, that God had planned from the outset. We are a continuation of this plan. Children are a promise that God isn't done with the plan yet. He's not done. That's why you're here. We're that are a little bit older are going to be gone, and it's going to be your job to carry the message forward. Yeah, I was just going to add also, um, so the Spirit gave them the power to speak, but... Don't be surprised because the demonstration of the Spirit comes too. So, right. There's, there's power that's associated. There's healing. We see some healing. A lame man healed. So he says here, Jesus is the stone the builders reject and he's become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these were unschooled, ordinary people, men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they couldn't see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What do we see happening here? What, what attitude? Go on back. Uh, yeah. This Tiffany talked about this earlier. We see they had courage. I was just like even prior to that, and then again here, they there's no shame in naming the name, naming the name of Jesus. Yeah. But just by association, uh, they know that that they've been changed by this name. Yeah. yeah, they took note. I love that. It's like they took note. Those guys right there, they've been with Jesus. I wonder how many people are taking notes when we go around, when we're around them. Like, man, they've been with Jesus. That's what we need to look like. We, that's what God has in store. When we reset the table, it needs to include being so close with Jesus that people take note we've been with him. We're different. We're different. Not weird. But different. Maybe a little weird, but, but not for weird sake, right? We're not just trying to be weird oddballs out there with signs, repent or die, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, maybe we've got to take a stand that way at some points. All right. So they saw this and they conferred together. Uh, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spe spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer in this name. Um, then they called them in again and commanded them to speak, not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eye, to listen to you or to listen to God? You be the judge. As for us, we can't help but speaking about what we've seen or heard. After further threats, they let him go. They couldn't decide how to punish him. Because all the people were praising God for what happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. What do we see in this? What do we see uh, attributes and, and attitudes or mindset of those who were following? Behaviors and what the result was. Over 40 is a senior citizen, yeah. <laughs> the guy was old. He was 40. For me, the, the um, Sadducees were, didn't want to lose control. These yeah. people had changed, and were going to change the course of history, really. Yeah. They didn't want that to happen. They have their laws and their beliefs. And, whoops, somebody's trying to change. Sometimes you've got you to fight against the system, as it were, the worldly system of the, the political power of the day, you know, to say, no, this isn't God's way. God's way is to, is to perform you know, to change lives, to heal, to restore, to bring resurrection. That's God's way. It's different. What else? Well, I love verse 20. For we cannot, we cannot um, help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I mean, that should be us, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't help. I mean, I don't know how many of us, we're around each other enough. We can help. We, we can help. We would say, um, <laughs> We, we can help speaking about what we've seen or heard. We don't always do that. What they're saying is, we cannot help but speak about this. But we're like... Yeah, you, you can threaten me with prison and jail and death, and, but I can't, not, I can't stop talking about him. What, what are you trying to say? I mean, we see this from the beginning, but the excitement and the conviction that they have is what's really compelling them. It's the spirit, but they're excited about it. They're, they have a strong conviction about it. And we have to have that same thing. Right. So, that we're, we're, we lack that at times. And because we don't want to upset the apple cart. We don't want to be looked at as weird. We don't want to uh, you know, offend anyone. And yet, I think about what's at stake? Me offending you or your eternity? <laughs> Knowing God, knowing that some, there is a, a creator who loves you deeply, 
Which is more offensive? Yeah. Withholding the message or sharing the message? It's clearly withholding the message is more offensive. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord. And now I want you to look up at the screen because you'll, you'll catch where I'm getting at here. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. What do we see in all this? A theocentric prayer. <laughs> yeah. God-centered prayer. It's all about what he was doing, about his plan, his servant. Anything else stick out from that section? Verse 24, I just love that they raised their voices together, and Mike says, with singleness of heart. What's that communicate? Union. They're united. Yeah, unity. unity. They're united. Even before that, I, I love that verse 23. What'd you see in verse 23? Good news travels fast. Good news travels fast, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the word they reported. They reported back. Let me tell you what God did. I did. Man, we were out, we were at the colony. And you wouldn't believe this guy. I never met this guy. You know, there was a reporting back. There was a, a testimony time that was being shared. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your servant, Jesus Christ. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of the Lord boldly. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully in, at work in all of them that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought the money for sales, put it at the apostles' feet, it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, I, they just get specific here, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What do we see in all this? In this last section. <coughs> yeah. They had no need. They, they lived as community. It's funny because Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. But this isn't about poverty. It's about need. Right? There's a distinction. You can be wealthy and have need. You can be poor and have no needs. So it's about needs, not, not wealth or finances. Well, I want to run through this. I want to just point out eight things that I think that are observations from, from Acts. The first thing is they spoke with boldness and courage. And the question is, where does boldness and courage come from? I think it's from the testimony of Jesus in your life. There's, I don't have a reason to be ashamed. You know, I was in uh, one of our pastor's offices and someone came in and was, and was sharing something. There was a, a mistake that was brought up and, and I was like, ah, you know, I'm sorry about that and, and we can fix it. And, and the person that brought up the mistake left the room. The person that was in the room with us said, I can't believe you just did that. I'm like, did what? And they were like, if that would have been me, I would have felt so ashamed and embarrassed. And I would have thought I'm such a failure. I stink. I'm useless. I should find. I'm like, over that? I'm like, man, I messed up, up enough. That ain't, that's small potatoes, man. I'm not even concerned about that. But really, what's the reality here is that I know who, I know who my God is. And I'm not concerned about mistakes. I want to do well. 
but I'm not going to allow a mistake to cripple who I am. Or, or in this case, uh, I'm not going to allow fear of people to keep me from being bold and courageous. I, it, it doesn't matter what you think. I love you. But if what I'm doing is what the Holy Spirit has told me to do, I cannot be concerned about your response. I'm going to be bold and courageous as it relates to that. We all should be. That's in verses 1, 13, and 29. The second thing, that an observation that they taught, they proclaimed Jesus was resurrected. Well, how do we do that? We build relationships, you speak, get in spiritual conversations, know and live out the gospel and proclaim it. This is the thing on earth that we have to do that we won't do in heaven. The third thing, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Verses 8 and 31. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus was pretty clear. Ask the Father for the Holy Spirit. This is not confusing. It's not complicated. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But but we need, that's a bucket of water if you can't tell what that is from where you are. And it's just being, over, it's overflowing with water. And that's what we should be like with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should be just oozing out of us. He cannot, the world cannot take, contain the Holy Spirit. There's not like eight pieces of a pie that gets split up amongst seven billion people. The, no, the Holy Spirit is fully in you and can be fully in me and everyone else at the same time and lose no power. That's the amazing thing. So we need to be filled with the Spirit. The fourth thing, increase in acts of kindness. Man, if we just were a little more kind to people, it would change things. It, it could change things. We were just talking about Mormons and how exciting they are. Um, you know, they're, they're very positive and they tend to be upbeat in how we just, we have a little bit different thing. I was talking to someone who just came from Utah and they're like, oh man, we met these Mormons. We were hiking and they were just so kind and awesome. And I said, yeah, but they're going to hell. You know, it's like we were, we kind of chuckled about that. They have bad theology, but their bad theology is covered over by how good they treat people. We've got the right theology. We should be all the more demonstrating and increasing acts of kindness. We're going to be called to give an account how we respond to people. The fifth thing, we need to give Jesus credit. It, it needs to be pointed to him. Verse 10, we saw that in that passage later on in 20, whatever that was, where they, it just was, you this, your servant, you. It was just theocentric, focused on God. Six, gives testimony. We need to be a testimonial people who are testifying to God's goodness, who are making reports, prayer requests, together in unity. That it's, it's a thing when we come together, great power can be displayed, and it only happens as we're close to Jesus. The seventh thing is there is a unity. That's the, these two go together. I think prayer and unity go together. Um, they're one in heart and mind. It really comes down to we need to be thinking on things about not what I'm comfortable with, but on things about. Number eight, they weren't materialistic, but were supernaturally generous. They, it was not just a, you know, I give out of my abundance. No, they were supernaturally generous. And I wonder if we could, if we were that supernaturally generous, you know, and I'm thinking about what that means for me and for our family. Uh, and it, it isn't, it's not money. I mean, it might include that, but, but there are ways to be supernaturally generous that are beyond what this world sees. And that kind of is coupled with acts of kindness. It might be you, you give someone your car or, I mean, who knows? It could be any number of things. <coughs> And we see that all throughout. They shared, they met needs. So how should we be setting the table? This is where I'm ending. I'm going to use the word table for how we should set the table. The first thing, we need to talk about Jesus. We need to talk to people and talk boldly about Jesus. In Romans 10, 14, and 15, the Bible is clear that, that people cannot come to heaven without hearing the message. Someone, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word. Someone needs to tell the message. So the T in table is to what? Talk about God. Talk about Jesus. 
The A in table is to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. In Luke eleven thirteen, this is what Jesus told us. It was a part of, uh, of the parable, and uh, he said that, which of you, if your father asks for a fish, will give him a snake in instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Have you asked for more of the Holy Spirit? Ask for more of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. Not that, you know, all of a sudden, oh, oh, I'm filled, you know, <laughs> and now you're losing that. No, but, I mean, it's, it's a part of the process. The B for table. Bless others generously. Acts 20, 35. In Acts 20, 35, it says that everything I did, Paul, or Luke says this, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, we had a young man living with us at one point who had a little bit of backwards theology, but was honest. And he said, you know what? I know the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, but I like receiving. <laughs> I mean, he was honest. And how many of we really would like to receive? But what's the more blessed way? Is to give. We don't want help, right? We don't, don't help me. But I like to receive a gift. But it's more blessed to give than to receive. So bless others with surprisingly supernatural generosity. The L in table. We want, we want to love one another more than demand our own way. And this is John 15, 13. Uh, that that uh, Janet, Janet pointed out in her devotional, John 15, 12. But yeah, in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And then at the end of that, he says, this is my command, love each other. And then he out, the Bible outlines what love is. And then finally the E, to eliminate every need you can. You want to reset the table? Talk about Jesus. Ask for more of the Spirit. Bless others generously. Love people, like biblically. I'm not talking about this this cultural love, you know, uh, that, that you see in these bumper stickers with the rainbow colors. I'm not talking about that kind of love. You know, love is love. You've seen that. No, love, God is love. Love isn't love. God is love. Love is patient, kind. I mean, the Bible outlines it. Look, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And I am love. If you don't love your brother whom you can't see, who you can't see, and say you love God, who you can't, you lie. You can't love God and not love your brother or sister according to the scripture. And then if you want to really uh, live out this faith, we got to eliminate other people's needs. We see them and we do what we can as though that need. Why? Because that's what God has done for us. We have had a need that's eternal and God has eliminated it through Jesus Christ. So we ought to do likewise. So the question is, what's on your table? Jesus invites us to come to the communion table. And he says, this, this is my body which was broken for you. I want you to remember all these things I'm telling you to do. Are, I've demonstrated it for you. I laid my life down for you. And I want you to go and do likewise. And if you do that, this world will be transformed. And, and he goes a little further and he says, that, that's why I shed my blood. This blood is a new covenant with you. It's for the forgiveness of your sins. You're not going to get this perfect, but I paid the price for it. So when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming my death and my resurrection. You are remembering what I've done. You're identifying with me. And when you do this, the world will be transformed. That's his promise. So we're going to take communion. And the way this works, you peel the top off. There's a little wafer. You can eat the wafer, or, or you can dip the wafer and then eat it. Be careful opening the juice part, or you will have new colors on your clothes. But uh, again, this is Christ's body, which is broken for you. And he says to not do this in an unworthy manner. What does that mean? It means that we don't recognize what Jesus did. It, you know, and some people say, well, it's if you have a wrong relationship with people. Yeah, that, that can be it too. But it ultimately comes down to not understanding that this represents Jesus' death and resurrection.
being buried and coming out. I mean, that's what we're doing. So I want to encourage you to take and eat and drink. Lord God, we thank you for this gift, this communion that we can celebrate in your name. We just ask that we would be a blessing because you have blessed us, that we would love because you first loved us. Help us to be bold and courageous as we're filled with your Holy Spirit to proclaim this good news to the ends of the earth, Lord, and to make the most of this life you've given us. We've exchanged so many things thinking that they're going to fill us better. But you alone are the one who satisfies. So God, we thank you. We ask for your blessing that we would go in, in the spirit of Genesis 12, uh, that all people would be blessed because they've come in contact with us. They see that Jesus is in us. Our lives are transformed and they want that. We love you, God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.